Good. It's good to have everybody here. You're not here by chance. You're not here by chance. The Bible said, Known unto God are all of His works from the foundation of the world. Father, I pray now, Lord, for the gift of teaching. I pray for, for the anointing, Heavenly Father, for wisdom, Your Word. I pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, turn to the book of Isaiah, chapter number 14, verse 12. Isaiah 14, 12. We're going to go back in today now with our second take now on Isaiah. Isaiah chapter number 14 and verse number 12. Isaiah was written about 700 years before Christ, folks, about 700 B.C., about 700 B.C., has 66 chapters. It has a definite break at chapter number 39 and 40, and we have 39 books of the Old Testament, 27 and a new, which makes 66 books. Some say, well, that's simply a coincidence. Well, whatever you want to call it, it's there. It's a reality. And what we have here in Isaiah chapter number 14 and verse number 12 is one of the three names for the devil. It says in verse 12, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? Now, the standard commentary on this is that this is a proverb or a lamentation against the king of Babylon. Look at verse 4 that thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon. And so a lot of them limit what happens here in Isaiah chapter number 14 to an earthly man. Limit it to an earthly man. And by doing that, they can get rid of a lot of problems in the text uh, if, uh, if you want to consider it a problem. I don't consider it a problem, but a lot of them see a problem here with the, with the, uh, with the Latin word Lucifer showing up here in Isaiah chapter number 14 verse 12. Now a lot of Christians don't know that this is a Latin word. All right. Now this is not a translation we're talking about. If we're talking about a translation, we're talking about going from one language into another language. That's one thing. But what we have here is that the word has been, uh, the word Hillel, which is the Hebrew word, has been replaced with the word Lucifer. Now, what we need to do is ask ourselves right off the bat, now, when did this happen? Why did this happen? And what's the issue involved in this happening? Well, the first time that Lucifer shows up in the, uh, in the Bible is in the Jerome's Latin Vulgate, which is about the 4th century A.D. Now, you have what's called the Old Latin, which was never a Bible with the books put together, but just portions here and there, the Old Latin, but the first time you had a Bible in Latin put together, where all the books were bound up together, is Jerome's Latin Vulgate. And that became the standard uh, Bible of the Catholic Church for a long time. So he uses the word Lucifer. And you ask yourself this question, well, why is Lucifer here in Isaiah chapter number 14, verse number 12? You remember I told you how that in 1945, 46, along in there, they found the Gnostic Gospels at Nag Hammadi in Egypt. This is North Africa. They dug these things up. They found them, and they, of course, began to decipher them, translate them, and all of that. Elaine Pagels, I've mentioned her to you before, has written a volume about the Gnostic Gospels, and she has been a proponent of the Gnostic Gospels and uh, as apparently self-described expert on the Gnostic Gospels, and of course, anybody that does, anybody that pushes the Gnostic Gospels over your Bible, folks, is literally into Luciferianism. But let's not get into that for a moment. Let's just think about what I just said. The Gnostic Gospels present an entirely different Christ that you, than what you find in the Bible. That's fact. They present a completely different Christ than what's found in the Word of God, the New Testament. Now, about uh, 130 to 202 A.D., one of the church fathers by the name of Irenaeus wrote against heresies. 
against heresies. This has been around for a long time, this document against heresies. The thesis of that, uh, of that uh, 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 work was he was taking apart piece by piece Gnosticism as it was known 2,000 years ago among these people who called themselves Christians. He was attacking it at its very source and he was calling it heretical. Now, why did he do that? He did that because Gnosticism 2,000 years ago was nothing in the world more than a rehashed or a remade Luciferianism. We'll talk about that in a minute. But until they found the Gnostic Gospels, now this is important. This document's been around a long time against heresies by Irenaeus. But until they found the Gnostic Gospels, that was about all that existed that related to Gnosticism 2,000 years ago. And you could come along and say, well, the man was going off of his rocker, you know. I mean, what's he talking about? We don't have anything else, but they did. When they dug up these Gnostic Gospels, found them at Nag Hammadi in North Africa, when they found them, lo and behold, as they began to read the Gnostic Gospels, Irenaeus's against heresies began to open up. Plainer words, here is a man who lived in the, in the, uh, from the first century to the second century after Christ. Here is a man who lived in the, who was right closely removed from, he was second, third century, closely removed from the Apostle John. Here's, here's the, here's the transmission, transition, transmission. John the Apostle had a disciple whose name was Polycarp. You've heard of Polycarp. Polycarp was a martyr. They, they, he was an old man. And they, they martyred him for his faith in Christ. But Polycarp had a disciple whose name was Irenaeus, Bishop of Lyon. And Irenaeus, therefore, is one man removed from the Apostle John. We're talking about men who knew men who knew the original apostles. Now think about that for a minute. Huh. Think about that. Think about a man whose teacher had been taught by John himself. That's quite a thing, isn't it? All right, now think about his position. The position that Irenaeus takes is absolutely opposed to Gnosticism, Luciferianism, however you want to describe it and define it. His position is absolutely opposed to that, and he does everything within his power uh, when, when he's on this earth to show the world what a wicked, vile, godless, uh, corrupt thing that Luciferianism is. And so when they dug up, when they dug up the, the Gnostic Gospels, they, they corroborated everything he said. They, there, there you are. You've got, you've got in stone, literally, you've got written in stone uh, the text that had been buried for 2,000 years. No, notice carefully where they were buried. Where? North Africa. At, at one time housed one of the largest libraries in the world. Which one? Alexandria. Exactly. And uh, there was a hotbed of Gnosticism, uh, uh, Zoroastrianism, uh, uh, all kinds of isms. I can't think of all of them involved. The Queen of Heaven was worshipped there in North Africa. Now, this is important. I mentioned the Queen of Heaven to you. It seems like when we get to digging a little deeper into these church fathers, Irenaeus and Tertullian, it seems like they knew more than people give them credit for. It's amazing. They did know more than people give them credit for. For example, the word Hillel in Isaiah chapter number 14, verse number 12, that's translated Lucifer in, your, in the Latin Bible, and, and it comes down to us into the, into the English Bible, was a reference to the morning star. It was a reference to the planet Venus, well known 2,700 years ago as being represented by, guess what? The Queen of Heaven. The Queen of Heaven has among, one, uh, among her titles, one of her titles is Mother of God. Theotokos, they call it. They had a big dog fight in the first century after Christ about the wording, Mother of God, Mother of God. Now the, now the Virgin Mary is the mother of our Lord Jesus Christ. All right? Okay? But she did not give birth to God. She gave birth to the God-man. And there was a big dog fight in the first century after Christ about that. Some went one way, some went another. 
And the, the Catholics, of course, went, to, went, the, went the route mother of God, which is a direct term for the queen of heaven. She's called the mother of God. Now, how do we understand that? We have to understand it in the context of Gnosticism. We have to understand it in the context of the old Brahmin religion in India, in the context of Luciferianism, in the context of all of this occult world. And here is how it works. They believe, as Madame Blavatsky in Theosophy taught when she published her magazine, the Lucifer magazine, that the Father is a universal spirit force that permeates everything. But this is the important part, folks. This is what is so important. He is not a person. He's a force. Now, now, now think on that for a minute. He gives forth emanations, which are called eons, and these emanations give forth more emanations or creatures or creators and on down the line. But this force, this force that is, that is, that is not a person, every evolutionist that you try to talk to, all right, you try to talk to an evolutionist, all right, you're going to ask him one question. I mean, there's no sense in, in messing around with a bunch of junk. Get to the point. One question. It is obvious that there is a design going on in creation. If you can't see that, you're ignorant. All right? Who designed it? Here's what he'll tell you. He'll say, well, now, of course, you being a Christian and you being a Bible-believing Christian, you believe that Jehovah designed it, the God of the Old Testament and all that. But we believe that there is some kind of a universal force, a mind, nous in Greek, a mind that is doing this. It is not personified, you know, in a person, but it is, a, it is nonetheless a power out there. We can't describe it, define it, put it under a microscope, but it does exist because there is definitely something going on, but we are not about to get on the bandwagon with you and say we believe in a creator. You know why they don't want, to, you know why they don't want on that bandwagon with the creator, don't you? You got a creator, you got to answer to that creator. You've got to answer to him, and they, don't do, they do not want accountability. And don't you think that's remarkable? Now, there are those evolutionists that will say to you, well, I have no idea. I mean, it's just there. It happens. And, and you look back at him, and you say, you really think? Are you thinking? Are you using your mind? What, where did DNA come from? I mean, how did you think that this is just mindless, accidental development? Or isn't there some kind of an intelligence going on here? And so if he will acquiesce and say there is an intelligence, he'll say it is a universal spirit, spirit form. You know what? That's exactly what Plato said 300 years before Christ. That's exactly what the Gnostics believed. This is what's called, and you can, you can define it in different ways. Pantheism is one way to say it. That is where... That is where God, remember now, semantics, when I say God and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the Gnostic says God, we're not talking about the same thing. When I say God, I'm talking about a personal being who is almighty and eternal and from everlasting to everlasting, and his name's Jehovah. Amen. That's God. But when they say God, you got to watch words. They're not talking about that. See, they're not talking about that. And this is why Christians get sucked in and get trapped so many times because they'll be talking to a new ager, they'll be talking to one of these people, and they're using the same terminology you're using, and yet they're not talking about the same thing at all. They're talking about something entirely different. So the issue there is that God, God, the Creator, brought into existence everything that exists. But they got a spin for that when you get into Gnosticism, and their spin is this. These emanations that came forth from this spirit, this spirit mind, this all-pervading father out there that is, that is non-distinct, that, is, that, is, that cannot be fully understood or fully known, but there's some kind of something out there, brought forth these emanations or eons. One of them, as I mentioned to you before, jumped the gun 
and read, ran ahead of the other, and her name was Sophia. Now, Sophia means wisdom. And when she did, she caused a demiurge to come forth from her. And that demiurge that came forth from her, came coming forth, coming forth, coming forth, coming forth, the demiurge that came forth from her is the Jehovah of the Old Testament. See how they've lowered him? They've lowered him. And therefore, this demiurge that came forth from her, now watch this, began to create physical things. This is why the Gnostic, if you, if you know the, the least bit about Gnosticism, you know that that which is physical is evil and that which is spiritual is good. And so this demiurge began to create physical things. So in a sense, they go along with what the Bible says about the creator. He began to create, but he doesn't know that he came forth from Sophia. He thinks that he has always existed and he creates archons that help him. Archon is an angel, a cherubim, a seraphim, and all of that. They can pull out of the Bible anything they please, put their own spin on it, and then hand it back to you. So he creates archons to do his bid, and he is the petty tribal God of Israel of the Old Testament, and that he's very jealous and doesn't want you to know any more than what he wants you to know. And so the great mind and light of the universe showed up in the garden to our parents. And you know who he was? He was that gnosis. You know what that word gnosis means in Greek? To know. What do you mean? It implies knowledge, light, and understanding. Guess what that name means? Lucifer. So when you set it in the context like that, then Lucifer becomes a good thing, a good being. He's, he's, he's benevolent toward man. And he wants to teach us more and show us more. But the God of the Bible, which is a superstitious, petty demiurge, tries to hinder Lucifer's revelation of himself to mankind. He's trying to hinder that. And so therefore, if you ever are enlightened with the Gnosis, the Gnostics, you'll rise above the God of the Bible, and you'll begin to receive direct revelations from that Father Spirit out there. And the way to do that is through a channeler. Almost all of these people that write these books about, about uh, the New Age movement, uh, Gnosticism, stuff like that, have a channeler. They have a spirit guide that guides them into the higher echelons of understanding and learning. Now, that's in a nutshell. That's a bunch of stuff. Irenaeus and Tertullian, right off the bat, two church fathers, fought tooth and toenail, everything with everything in their power to stop this stuff, and they put out the information to do it. And so, watch this, when Jerome translated the Bible into Latin, he had that material laying right before him, and he knew when he got to Isaiah chapter number 14, verse number 12, aha, that's the devil. That's the devil. And a lot of what he did, he based it on the work of Tertullian and the, on the work of Irenaeus. And when he got to that passage right there, he had read where the Lord Jesus says, I saw Satan as lightning fall from heaven. And so he said, that's Hillel, that's Venus, that's the morning star, that's Lucifer. Now you say, well, now how can you have two morning stars? You can have two Christ. We've got two Christ. We've got the Lord's Christ and we've got another Christ. In Ezekiel chapter number 28, the Bible says, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast in the holy mountain of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The tabrets and all of that, the musical instruments that made up this creature he said, but I'm going to bring you down. Now, anointed in Old Testament Hebrew is Mashiach. In New Testament Greek, it is Christos, where we get the word Christ. So just because something is a Christ doesn't mean it's the true Christ. And just because it's anointed doesn't mean it's the anointed one, the holy one. You ever notice the confrontations that took place in the New Testament between the Lord Jesus Christ and demons? 
the demon would talk back to him and said, I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. Sometimes you get more truth out of a demon than you, than you do. <laughs> you know, the fountain. Uh, you got to watch the fountain, but the truth's the truth. Amen. He is the Holy One of God. All right, here's the rub. Here's the big rub. Number one, rub number one. God is not an impersonal force. God is a being. He's an absolute, eternal being. Number two, God was manifest in flesh 2,000 years ago. God became a man. Now, robing himself in flesh is beautiful talk. But he didn't robe himself in flesh. He became flesh. In other words, the implication is that if you robe yourself, you can take the robe off. See, and that's all pretty and all that. I'm not here to be critical. I've probably used this term myself. But, he said, but the scripture says, the word became flesh. The Bible says two times about the becoming of flesh. In the book of Hebrews, I mean, the book of Romans chapter number 8 and Hebrews chapter number 4. It says this. It says, he likewise took part of the same that he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Both times when it refers to the Lord Jesus Christ, God becoming flesh, it says very clearly, yes, he did become flesh, but his flesh was not fallen flesh like your flesh. There is a difference. So rub number two is God becoming flesh. Rub number three is that man is made in the image of God. And I'll tell you right now, if you want to make an evolutionist mad, you tell him, listen, I was made in the image of God. Amen. See, the evolutionist believes in this all-pervading universal spirit. Everything has life. Everything has life force. Everything has its place. And God is in everything. And so you're just one biological creature that happens to be living at, uh, at, 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 during this period of time. But when you say, no, I was made in the image of God. I am superior and supreme to every dog, cat, mouse, rat, chicken, squirrel, bird on the face of this earth. That one little human being boy is worth more than the animals. Oh, they hate that. I mean, they go into a screaming rage when you talk to them like that. And this is what Agenda 21 is all about. It's what, about, it's what, about, it's what the, the green movement is all about. It's just another door into a one world government. And that's what all, this is all about. It, they want to tear you down from your God-given uh, essence that you are, you are a human being made in the image of God. They hate that. That's a rub. They despise that doctrine. Did you know that a Christian, that what we believe as Christians when we believe the Bible, we are the only people on the face of this earth that teach that we were made in the image of God. If I go to a Brahmin, which becomes a Buddhist, which becomes a Hindu, and I go to that Brahmin and I talk to him about God, you know what I get from him? He is an impersonal, all-pervading, universal spirit, a soul. Well, then how in the world could I be made in the image of a universal, all-pervading uh, spirit? See what I mean? But when I say that God made me in his image, then that changes the story, the, the narrative completely. Because you see, when the Lord Jesus Christ came 2,000 years ago, one of the things of the many he did, one of the things that he did is restore the fallen image of God. When God made that first man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, he didn't breathe into anything else. He simply spoke it into being. But he breathed into that man. That man was raised up from the dust. One of the most beautiful uh, paintings I ever saw, and I can't remember where it was. I wish I could. Some, some soul uh, years ago had the presence of mind to paint dust, literally dust, just falling away and an image coming up out of that dirt and a hand reaching down, pulling that image up and that's man coming up from the ground coming up from the dirt from dust thou art he said pulling that man up and that man was made in the image of God he was so much like the Lord Jesus Christ that he's called the first Adam and Christ is called the last Adam he's called the first man Christ is called the second man 
So there's an awful lot going on there. Now here's what's happening today. Since we've got this big dog fight going on here in Isaiah 14, 12, you know, most of, the, most of them won't bother to go, in, to go into any depth in dealing with it. So here's what you're getting in the Christian community. This is the kind of commentary that you're going to get. Now, this is, this is Gail Ripplinger's New Age Bible version. It's been out since 90, uh, 90, uh, 93. So it's been, out 20, uh, it's been out 23 years. Okay. How many how many's ever read this one? This is a good book, folks. This woman right here did her research. This is a college professor. And you know the story about Gail. I had her here in the church about 20 years ago. And she's, uh, she was one of the sweetest ladies I've ever met in my life. All right, here's what she says. She says, the International Bible Commentary, edited by F.F. F. Bruce, when it comes to Isaiah 14, 12, says, it is inappropriate to the passage to think Satan is meant. Harper's Bible Dictionary the connection was made erroneously between Lucifer and Satan. I've got the Anchor Bible Dictionary on, uh, at home on a computer. And uh, the Anchor Bible Dictionary, when I type the word Lucifer in, you know what I get for it? I mean, it's not even in the context. You know, you can run a search where you get the heading or you can, the, 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 what the subject about that, or you can find it as it's in the wording. Not even to be found. Isn't that amazing how that the church is being misled about Lucifer? Remember what I told you about Irenaeus, Tertullian? Remember what I told you about that? Listen to this uh, little tidbit I picked up right before I came over here this morning. This is remarkable. This fellow here did his homework. He says, the actual name Lucifer goes back to the Greeks before the Romans Socrates and Plato talk about this, and watch this, God of light. Surprisingly, not in the context of the God of dawn, but as a morning star. Yeah. Juxtaposed with the sun, Helios, and Hermes. This information can be found in Plato's Timaeus and Edith Hamilton's mythology. Mythology. Did you hear the word Mythology. Let's watch this show up here for us. Erdman's Bible Dictionary. Lucifer is not included in this dictionary. They refer the reader from Lucifer to Daystar, that's Jesus Christ in parenthesis, saying another name for Morning Star. Some commentators link the, uh, to link the idea with an ancient myth about the banishment of a divine person. Now, how many of you believe that there was an anointed cherub that was cast out of heaven. Well, how many of you believe that the Lord Jesus Christ knew what he was talking about when he said, I saw Satan as lightning fall from heaven? Yes. See? When the Lord Jesus Christ said, get thee behind me, evil, impersonal, all-pervading force. That's not what he said, is it? He said, get behind me what? He addressed him personally. And after 40 days in the wilderness, Satan came to him. Now, Hebrew, the word Satan is a Hebrew word, and it means adversary. All right? Adversary. The apostle John over there in 1 John says, your adversary, the devil. Satan is the adversary who practices his adversity as a devil. See how it goes? He's devilish in what he does. But anyway, myth. Boy, I mean, my Bible's got myths in it. And then uh, Smith's Bible Dictionary. From Jerome downward, it referred to Satan. The New Standard Bible Dictionary, Funk and Wagnall, editor M. W. Jacobs. Lucifer is not included. They refer the reader to the day star, which states applied to Lucifer and Christ. Here we go. What's going on here, preacher? I'll tell you what's going on here. In the Muslim religion, they teach that the Lord Jesus Christ is a prophet. Be very careful with the way I say things now. They teach he is a prophet. They teach that he's coming back 
And that when he comes back, he is going to come back with the Mahdi. When he comes back with the Mahdi, he's going to tell the world that he has renounced Christianity and is now a Muslim. And that he's going to call the whole world to submit themselves. That's what Muslim means. It means one that has submitted to Islam. To submit themselves to Islam, he's going to destroy the cross and, sell, and tell the world that everybody has been misled that he's not the son of God, that he's just a prophet and that he's coming back. Now, is there any way, as you, a Christian, if you're a believer in Christ, born again believer, there's no way in the world that you can accept that statement? There's no way. No way. No way. But here's the thing. That is another Christ. The church is receiving another Christ. The identity of Lucifer and Christ is being confounded. It's being mixed up. If he comes as an angel of light, would you know which one is the light and which one is the angel of light? It's a very serious issue today where scholarship, and these are the people who write the commentaries that most young Christians buy when, they first, when they're first saved. You know, they want light on a passage. They want to read commentary. And so they'll get a commentary and they'll start reading it. And they'll get over to Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12, and they'll wind up thoroughly confused. They'll wind up disbelieving their Bible. They'll wind up believing that the Bible writers like Isaiah were misled by Canaanite mythology. You get a lot of that. Now, if that's the case, if Isaiah was misled by Canaanite mythology, then what in the world are we calling it an inspired book for? You see what I'm saying? You see what I'm saying? It's an amazing thing at what the occult world says about Lucifer and what the church world is saying about Lucifer and how they're coming together. Yes, sir. It's a gradual thing. Yeah. Like a Fabian socialist. They've got plenty of time. Exactly. Bring it in. Sure. Sure they are. Sure they are. I was listening to a preacher the other night. And he said that 600 pastors were, were, were interviewed about the things I'm talking about here and issues as they relate to contemporary issues. 600 pastors were interviewed. Only 12% of that 600 had anything to say about the stuff I'm talking about and about the contemporary issues as it relates to this, that the vast majority of them were afraid of the Internal Revenue Service and their 5013C exemptions and all the rest of it that goes with it and whatever else. In plainer words, their God is their belly. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now think about this. Uh, one, of the, one, of the, one of the Christian celebrity pastors in our country is pushing a movement called Chrislam. Now what's Chrislam? Chrislam is where you try to unite the God of the Muslim with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and say they're the same. That Jehovah and Allah are the same. No, they're not. Allah's the moon God. Jehovah is the Lord God Almighty. Manifest in flesh 2,000 years ago, God became man. How in the world could you ever join up with a Muslim and say we worship the same God when that Muslim says that Christ did not die on the cross, 
He says that Christ was not God manifest in the flesh. He says that God does not have a son and that anybody that teaches that God has a son is going to go to hell. Now tell me how the two of you can join together and stand up and say that you're brothers and unite and say that you're worshiping the same God. And yet people are swallowing it hook, line, and sinker. They're doing it. It's, part, it's just part of the culture. Yeah. Yes, sir. It's uh, right. I'll tell you who they. I'll tell you who, who you're talking about. Turn to the book of Titus. Titus chapter one. All right. Verse 10. Just remember this is in here. Titus 1.10. Now who wrote Titus? Paul the Apostle, right in chapter 1, verse 1. Now look at verse 10. There are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not, for filthy lucre's sake. And what, how many know what filthy lucre is? That's not potato chips. All right. All right. Verse 12. One of themselves, even a prophet, and watch this, of their own, said, The Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. Now, let that settle in and then get the next verse and let this settle in. This witness is true. <laughs> of all the things in the New Testament, he picks out a group of people <laughs> and he said, they are as sorry and low down as you get. Now, how many, ha how many of you have ever heard of the word Cretan? You ever heard it used? That's what they're talking about. You can't say a worse thing about somebody than to call them a Cretan. That's who he's talking about. Titus chapter number one, a Cretan. You're saying that you are the low life of the low life. <laughs> You're under the bottom of the barrel. There is no character to you. You are a scourge. And the apostle Paul said, now think about this for a minute. And I'm not sure I've got it completely. Uh, in my soul what this man meant by this, but he said, this witness is true. I understand on the surface of what he means by it. I understand that. But what's the implication in that statement? This witness is true. That's a powerful statement, don't you think? Amen. And of course, uh, most people say that's a reference to Crete, C-R-E-T-E. When I was in the military, I went into a Mediterranean tour, a, a cruise, I was kicking and screaming they took me. <laughs> Hadn't been married any time. Tried my best to get out. I didn't have enough rank pull. <laughs> didn't know anybody, so I had to go. And uh, we went to Crete. And it's an island out there in the Mediterranean. It's a different place. It's out there. It's there. And apparently, this is who he's talking about. Now, if you know any people from Crete, uh, keep them away from 1 Timothy <laughs> and, until they're ready to set it in context and say, well, now that's the way it was 2,000 years ago. Hopefully things have changed a little bit since then. Yes, sir. The Philistines, you say? Yeah, not Palestinians. Philistines, they, they, well, they were seafaring people. The Philistines were. They were boat builders. And uh, they came from that area up in there. Some think that they came from the, uh, what's that group uh, back in, uh, they, they had, uh, I can't think of them right now. They weren't Romans, they weren't, they weren't Greeks. Uh, what? Phoenicians. Well, the Phoenicians who we're talking about, but they think they came from Etruscan. Etruscan. They think that there's a connection with the Etruscans. But a lot of that stuff you can't be certain about, you know, it's just... But, Uh huh. Giants from that. Uh huh. They found giants up there, haven't they? Yeah. You make a connection with giants, but but the, but but you find them and you're finding giants all over that place. 
Yes, sir. And yeah, yeah. Well, they could, it's a lot of ma folks make the connection between uh, Philistines and Phoenicians, and then go back to the Etruscans, and the movement of whole groups of people in places like that. And it's fascinating reading, but it's hard to pinpoint it. Yeah, it is. It is. All right, we're going to pick up Lucifer again next week. We're going to move into Satan. And uh, I hope I've laid a groundwork here for Lucifer. I mean, I hope after all that I've said that you come away with the idea, well, that preacher believes that the Bible's correct. Yes, sir. Amen. I don't believe any mistake was made when, uh, if Jerome is the one who put that into the Jerome's Latin Vulgate, or he simply used what was there and put it into the Latin Vulgate, whatever, that's where it shows up the first time, is the Latin Vulgate. Latin. You remember now, Satan has three names in the Bible. One of them is Hebrew. One of them is Greek. One of them is Latin. Which one is Latin? Lucifer. Lord of mercy, help us. Lucifer. Which one is Hebrew? Satan. Satan. Which one is Greek? Devil. Diablos. All right. And on the top of the cross at Calvary, the Titleist, the charges brought against Christ, that's what it was. The Titleist, that's what it's called. What three languages were written? Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Isn't that amazing? Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. All right. Yes, sir. Yeah. In the Baptist church. Isn't that sad? There's an awful lot of them that don't believe in the virgin birth. They certainly don't believe in the new birth. They don't believe in hell. They don't believe the blood atonement. And that's right in the Baptist church. That's why when I get up and I preach, I don't preach Baptist church. I preach Christ Amen. and Him crucified. All right, we'll meet again next Sunday morning, 10 o'clock for Sunday school, Lord willing. And we'll uh, take a break now, and, uh, and church will start at 11 o'clock. Brother, will you dismiss us, please?